Thanks for inviting me, Professor Migliore, moderators. Um, hope to share with you uh, the project that we did in Dallas, Texas, uh, using intraarticular steroid therapy, comparing it to intraarticular hyaluronate injections for lumbar facet arthropathy. I appreciate the previous speaker laying down the foundation of the anatomy and the pathology and the clinical presentation of lumbar facetogenic pain. So it saved me some trouble. There it is. Uh, this was an unfunded study. Um, it was, uh, we used an off-label indication for Synvisc, which was the product that we used, which is not FDA approved in the United States for use in lumbar facet joints. This was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled prospective study. So the level of evidence in this uh, research investigation is a level one. This study has been published uh, in the American Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And uh, the co-authors are listed in this uh, screenshot. So as you all know, and as the previous speaker alluded to, uh, the facet joint syndrome res will result in uh, significant morbidity and clinical presentation of lumbar uh, a low back pain and uh, pseudo-radicular pain. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is commonly used to uh, manage this pain in a long-term basis. It's one of the most common procedures done in pain management clinics around the country and the world. Injecting products into the joint is also commonly performed especially the use of corticosteroids in lumbar facet joint arthropathy has not been very uh, well supported by literature. Um, injecting viscoelastic supplementation is even less commonly studied and performed. Um, even though it has been used and supported, as we have heard here in the last two and a half days, and uh, it's been uh, still supported in the United States as well for appendicular joints like the knee joint. So there's been uh, only three to four studies done prior to ours that have looked at viscoelastic supplementation injections in the lumbar facet joints. Uh, Cleary study was one of the first ones done. It was a pilot study that did not demonstrate any benefit. Few at all studied uh, about 15 years ago Facet joint injections with hyaluronic acid resulted in a marked reduction in pain with improved function and better quality of life, very similar to the steroid injections, so it, they were comparable. However, the hyaluronic acid showed longer duration of effect. De Palma, Michael De Palma studied it in 2009, showed modest efficacy at six months with hyaluronic acid injections. So since each of these studies had limitations, and um, they left the conclusions of comparison between steroid and hyaluronic acid uh, somewhat nebulous, somewhat inconclusive. We decided to do the comparison in a, with a pragmatic clinical practice uh, mimicker and uh, proceeded to do our investigation. A little bit more background on the use of intraarticular steroids in um, Subsequent to our study, there have been other studies that have been performed that compared intraarticular steroid in injections efficacy with other procedures. So this was a review article published in 2016, Schneider and Levin, and they actually sus uh, reported that if you have an increased spec uptake um, in your facet joints, those patients with low back pain associated with increased SPECT uptake, responded better to intraarticular steroids. So perhaps there is a, an imaging marker that predicts uh, an inflammatory uh, effect uh, and an anti-inflammatory effect from the corticosteroids. Um, there have also been other studies that looked at SPECT-positive joints had better improvement than SPECT-negative joints or clinically diagnosed joints. Um, this was a more recent study that was published that showed that intraarticular steroids had similar effect to a medial branch block with steroids. So that's another common off-label practice that's performed in the United States 
where you block the medial branch, not only with the local anesthetic, but you inject steroid, hoping it would last, make the effect of the medial branch block last longer. Uh, so these people, uh, investigators, studied that and found that intraarticular steroid was similar. So radiofrequency ablation, even though it has the most effective, statistically significant, and evidence basis behind it, is still destruction of a nerve. And um, it, unintended consequences have not really been studied effectively, such as loss of uh, sensory feedback from the joints, um, proprioceptive feedback from the joints, loss of um, denervation-related muscular atrophy of the multifidi and associated biomechanical consequences of doing that have not been adequately studied, in my opinion, despite the pain relief and the functional improvement afforded by doing a radiofrequency ablation. So I'm going back to the original construct of injecting the joints with something that will provide longer relief than corticosteroids, perhaps enabling the patient to return to function without any other unintended consequences, which was the reason why we decided to do our study, to compare intraarticular corticosteroids and hyaluronic acid. It was a prospective double-blind randomized placebo-controlled and not placebo-controlled comparative effectiveness study. Chronic low back pain patients who were referred to the Veterans Affairs Physical Medicine Rehabilitation Clinic were included in the study. They had to have symptomatic low back pain uh, with evidence of radiological evidence of some amount of degenerative joint disease. A physical exam has to be consistent, and we use uh, the Helbig and Lee study as our clinical evidence to say that this would be potentially facetogenic in origin. That included a facet loading maneuver of hyperextension and lateral uh, rotation. Uh, we use the following exclusion criteria because any of these criteria would make the patient a little bit different than our usual population. Any previous surgery or lumbar radicular pain or any contraindication, any infection, any recent steroid or hyaluronic acid injection, those patients were excluded. We actually did an a priori power analysis for a detection of um, uh, uh, 30 millimeters of visual analog scale difference and an alpha error of 0.05, we predicted we needed 24 patients total. And including six dropouts, we estimated we needed 30 patients. It was IRB approved. We obtained informed consent, performed the baseline examination to determine if they satisfied the study criteria. We collected demographic information, height, weight, and duration of pain, assessed their pain on a 10-centimeter visual analog scale, and assessed their functional disability on a questionnaire called the Pain Disability Questionnaire, which is a patient-reported outcome measure. We performed the randomization using a research pharmacist that generated random numbers. And then the research pharmacist, based on the assignment, wrapped the syringe with an opaque tape so the injector could not see the contents of the syringe. And then we injected six joints. The lower lumbar joints of 3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 1 were injected bilaterally using fluoroscopic guidance. Sorry, we were not aware of you doing uh, ultrasound guidance or GPS-enabled ultrasound guidance at that time. And the, despite uh, us masking the syringe with the tape, you could still see the substance if you wanted to coming out of the extension tubing while performing the injection. So that would potentially violate the blind. Therefore, we decided that even that was uh, unacceptable, and we had an independent injector, a radio, uh, radiologist, an interventional radiologist, who performed the injections. And the rest of the study was performed by uh, uh, the uh, investigators. So we took an extra measure of masking the study investigators as well. Each joint received one ml of injector. That way we made the two groups equal amount of inject, uh, uh, volume of injectate. So it received either 10 milligrams of triamcin alone or one ml of the uh, High, Highland GF20, uh, so a total of six ml injected in each patient. We uh, looked at the outcome measures of pain and disability at one, three, and six months. 
We also looked at a secondary outcome measure of patient satisfaction six months after the procedure. So every patient reported their global satisfaction with the procedure on a zero to 100% scale. We compared the outcome measures between the two groups. We also looked at change in outcome measures and looked at a multiple regression uh, comparative, uh, comparative uh, statistical analysis. So here's the baseline data. Most of our patients were in the uh, upper 50s and 60s. They had uh, extremely chronic duration of pain. This is an average of 182 months. Um, if you know a veteran population in the United States, they're service-connected, meaning their, their back pain started at, while they were in the military. So almost all of them will report tens of years of pain. So this is a very common population. might be different than the population you might treat. Their average pain score at the beginning was 6.7 centimeters or 67 millimeters, and the average PDQ was uh, 101, so it goes from 0 to 150. And most of them were overweight or obese, and the average age between the two groups were similar. These were some minor variances in the study. Four subjects did not receive one injection in one joint because of difficulty with access. All of these were radiologically confirmed contrast-enhanced injections. So in one joint out of six in some of these patients, they did not get into the joint. Five subjects had transient or short-term pain increase, just short-lived. After one week, it went away. In one subject, this was an interesting observation, it triggered the first-time episode of rheumatoid arthritis. After uh, injection, we unblinded this patient, and it discovered that uh, he likely had an allergic response to uh, hyaluronic acid, which triggered a first-time response uh, uh, attack of rheumatoid arthritis, which was subsequently managed appropriately by the rheumatologist. Another patient died out of unrelated reasons, and one subject withdrew after the injection because he developed secondary symptoms of neurogenic claudication due to facet arthropathy. So here are the main data. At baseline, the Canelog group had pain score of 7, which went down to 5.8 and stayed similar to that the rest of the time. The Synvisc with baseline was 7.4, went down to 4.5 and stayed at 5.6 and 6.3. These group comparisons were non-significant at all three time points, so the groups were similar to each other at all three time points. On the PDQ score, average of 100 and 101, went down to 7, 7. 7.77 and 74, 87 and 74, 96 and 79. And all of these comparisons were non-significantly different as well. So essentially, they were similar. Overall satisfaction was also similar. 51% satisfied were the Kenalog group. 42% satisfied on an average was the Synvis group. And this was statistically similar as well. We compared a multiple uh, analysis of variance and we looked at all of these different variables that could potentially impact the outcome. Pain duration, age, body mass index, baseline pain level, baseline disability level, and group assignment, whether they were assigned to the study group or the treatment group. And none of these um, assignments, uh, none of these, uh, at the group assignment, we particularly were interested in whether the assignment of the group made a difference to the outcome, and it did not. These group assignments did not despite controlling for these variables at baseline. However, when we looked at all the control variables and individually studied each control variable, we found that the initial pain and the initial PDQ made a big difference. In other words, how significantly hurting you were and how significantly disabled you were at baseline determined the outcome much more than the assignment of the group. We also did within-group comparisons from baseline to later time points, and we found that within group, the Kenalog group had um, no significant differences in pain score, but they had a, it had a statistically significant difference at the one-month point only, but not at the three-month and six-month for the dis um, in the Synvis group. So in the pain in the Kenalog group, no significant differences in pain scores. In the Synvis group, only a short-term improvement within group. However, when we looked at the disability uh, comparisons we found that the Kenalog group had one month uh, statistically significant difference within group, but the Synvis group had a statistically 
significant difference at each of the three time points. In other words, within group, there was a maintained uh, functional improvement over six months. So it seemed to indicate that the uh, improvement in ability uh, lasted longer in the SINVIS group, although when we compared within, between groups, it did not make a difference. So analyzing total change, we found that there was a significant difference in the uh, hyaluronic acid group. Um, controlling for duration, it did not make any difference. In conclusion, we concluded that patients with symptomatic lumbar facet joint arthropathy, both groups attained equivalent uh, benefits. However, within group analysis showed the hyaluronic acid group had statistically significant short and long-term improvement in function and short-term improvement in pain compared to the steroid group. Since the conclusion of the study, many of the patients who were in the hyaluronic acid group have returned asking for repeated injections with hyaluronic acid, so they were pretty satisfied with the outcome. And um, one of the other conclusions, because of the effect of the duration of pain, could be that, as other studies have indicated that we heard yesterday, that if we were able to inject hyaluronic acid early on compared to like 15 years after onset of pain, perhaps we would have seen a more statistically significant difference. So that study is yet to be done. Uh, since this study concluded, we have attempted to uh, ask for grant funding to study this in a randomized control fashion, not only to compare between hyaluronic acid and steroid, but also use a sham control which would be the ultimate um, uh, reference standard to look at attributable effect. But th those studies have not been funded. People don't appear to have an interest in looking at interarticular applications in the lumbar facet joint, perhaps because radiofrequency ablation has taken such a strong foothold and it's insurance approved. I also want to acknowledge my co-authors and investigators on this slide. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me to give you this talk.